Good morning, good morning. Well, I finally got done with the Oliver Discourse. Hope you all enjoyed it. And let's start off with a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to get to look into your word and get better uh, meaning and understanding from your word. And as we head into Passion Week, uh, so we'd like to coin it uh, the week that uh, you yourself did the ultimate sacrifice for us and that uh, through your death on the cross, Lord, that we are able to someday look forward to a joyous life with you, Lord. And we can't praise you and thank you enough. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. You know, as a few a few of you probably don't know, my uh, I lost my daughter to an illness, a uh, virus that uh, took her life three years ago, uh, and so it's uh, even more important to me now, as I head into the future, that you never know what tomorrow brings. Uh, her particular week, on Monday, she was feeling ill. Uh, she had uh, asked her husband to take her to work because uh, she wasn't feeling up to driving. And her husband suggested she'd be seen by a doctor, so she went to the emergency room. By Tuesday afternoon, she was in a coma, and by uh, and uh, she never came out of the coma. They so never really know. So if there's anyone out there watching this video, they're still trying to decide what, how they feel about the Lord. Don't wait. Oh, Lord. Okay. Heavenly Father, I will reach out and thank you so much for bringing you into my life. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for me. And it, uh, and my, uh, my testimony will help others to see that uh, they need you. They need you desperately. As we look at this teaching, that uh, we think about uh, those that betrayed you. But uh, thank you, Lord, so much. And help me get through this passage. <laughs> In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay. So let me dry my eyes here and uh, get back to this scripture. I believe that my 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 daughter is in heaven. I hope she is. But to be uh, the honest truth is, I'm not absolutely positive. That's why. Not saying what I'm saying. Be absolutely sure. Don't give lip, lip service to people just because you think that's what they want to hear. Do you and the Lord. And you need to settle it. And I don't know why I'm speaking this way, but maybe somebody needs to hear it out there. So. Let me try to do, uh, recover from this. And let's get into the lesson. So we finish the Olivet Discourse. Uh, and I see Jesus shifting roles now. During his entire ministry, uh, some three years or so, he spent teaching. He was a rabbi. Uh, and that's why you'll hear people call him rabbi. Uh, that, uh, that's basically a teacher. And uh, as a, uh, a teacher, he was uh, ensuring that people knew about the uh, passing on what people needed to know to be saved and so that the events of the next few days for Jesus uh, that we've done uh, and finishing away coming into the uh, that season again here in April uh, the uh, crucifixion and uh, Easter Sunday and all that stuff I like to call it resurrection Sunday because uh Easter, you know Easter the name got its name kind of in a weird way so I like resurrection Sunday personally because that's what he did he rose from the dead, defeating death for us. But 
now we're going to move into it. Uh, so he, when he left the Oliver Discourse, he was still a teacher, and he wanted to uh, share his last few uh, last few things with the disciples. There's one other discourse. It's called the Upper Room Discourse, but I think it's more of a promise uh, than a teaching, because it's only given to the close uh, eleven apostles who are going to go on and start the church. And we won't be necessarily talking about that uh, during this study anyways. It's in John 14, 1 through 3, if you're curious. And that will actually happen after what I talk about tomorrow, which is the Passover. Uh, he does it that night, I believe. Uh, well, he does do it that night. But in Mark, I mean, in Luke, it doesn't really mention it. So we're going to talk about this man by the name of Judas. And he was the... Uh, and it's interesting that uh, so let's uh, let's let's look at uh, exactly. And basically, what we're going to be looking at is the is why Jesus had to do what he did, but also that he is fulfilling quite a few prophecies. And that's the other thing that uh, is so is so interesting about his life, death is that many of his prophecies were actually confirmed during this period of time. And I'll try to point to a few. Uh, and the first one being is that uh, uh, when John, when uh, Jesus came to be baptized, uh, water baptism, it's something that we uh, as Baptists firmly believe in. And it's based on this, uh, that, uh, that Jesus went and got baptized. But, but John the Baptist made a comment and it, uh, it's so true. And, and now that Jesus is going to be presenting himself as our Passover lamb. Uh, i just review back. So let me start reading here. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the next day, uh, and then it's over in John 1.29, I just wanted to point to the fact that Jesus is our Passover lamb. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is the only one who can take away the sin of the world. Because he was completely perfect. He was without sin. He was born uh, as a uh, immaculate conception through Mary uh, and, and uh, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, the original sin actually runs through the male side of, uh, of, uh, of the generation. That's the only reason that... Uh, uh, so that that's why Jesus had to be of a virgin birth. So I thought I would spend most of what I'm going to be talking about today is not so much about Judas, but first I thought I would uh, introduce this idea of the Passover. And these first six verses of uh, Luke is, uh, is about Judas and the fact that he is going to betray Jesus. But first, because it says it right here in this first verse, uh, Luke 22, verse 1 which is called the Passover. For those that don't know what the Passover is and where it started, uh, it actually started in Exodus. And if you don't know anything about Exodus, it's a great storyline. And uh, if you're somebody that loves movies, one of the one of the few movies I say is very, very well, well uh, biblically accurate, according to the movie. There's a movie by uh, Charlton, uh, that Charlton Heston was the actor who played Moses and the Ten Commandments. <laughs> and one of the few movies that I would say is biblically sound. Uh, there's very few uh, uh, mistakes in it uh, that, don't, that are uh, contrary to the Bible. But let's take a look at <clears throat> what the Passover is. And, uh, and the Passover is a type of Christ. The whole reason it started in Moses is it was actually a... Uh, a prophetic plan of, of Christ uh, and what he was going to do for us as our Redeemer. So it's in Exodus 12. Uh, it's actually almost the whole chapter of Exodus. But I'm not going to read the first 14 verses. And so that uh, uh, you get it, uh, a gist of it, enough for this study. Uh, but it goes into a little bit more detail even. I think it's pretty much all the way to verse 30 in Exodus I didn't want to, you know, spend the whole time just on uh, Passover, but this will give us a better understanding of what the Passover is. And we'll kind of go through it and how it equates to Jesus and what he's going to do for us. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year next to you. Uh, God here actually changed the calendar uh, for the Jewish nation. That uh, <laughs> He took the third month and ended up calling it the first month. Uh, and that's what they mean by that term there. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month thou shalt take to them every man a lamb. Make note of the tenth day there. Every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make you count for the lamb. So basically, if you're maybe just a single person, you can join in with a family next door, in other words. Your lamb should be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And he shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. You notice they, that they keep it aside and they watch it until the 14th day of the month. So it's being inspected for four days. Uh, make note of that. <laughs> And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein thou shalt eat it. Maybe I should quickly give you the backstory. Is it uh, this is during the time of the Exodus from Israel? I mean, from uh, Egypt, when Moses went to take the uh, Jewish nation out from Egypt, they were in captivity, and take them. Uh, they were under Pharaoh's rule, and take them to the Promised Land. But uh, of course, Pharaoh was resisting it. And the final plague was a plague that uh, when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, okay, that uh, the final plague, uh, basically, this is what one of the problems with the movie, is that it makes it sound like Pharaoh decided what the last plague was going to be, and no, he didn't. Uh, it was already decided that uh, the firstborn of every household uh, was going to die uh, in Egypt that night. And this is the this was what God told the Jewish people to do in order to uh, be bypassed by the angel of death. Continuing on here in verse seven, and he shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper posts of the house, wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at. Uh, at all with water, but roasted with fire, uh, his head with his legs and with his uh, pertinence thereof. He shall be loving nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning he shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. That was be ready to beat feet uh, at any time. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both of man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So that is, in a nutshell, what the Passover is. And uh, I actually uh, attended a church one time that used to celebrate by actually performing the whole ritual of the Passover meal. Fascinating thing. There's all kinds of different faces and different people speaking. <laughs> I was the youngest there at one time. And there's actually a, uh, as a, there's a little speech uh, that the youngest gives. And I, I can almost remember the whole verse, the whole line, which basically was, why do we eat unleavened bread tonight? Uh, it was the line as the youngest person there. So it was uh, really fascinating. And so we had somebody that really uh, uh, would purchase an actual lamb uh, and roast it. And we would go through the whole ritual of the Passover meal. Fascinating thing. I really enjoyed it. Kind of miss it, actually. <laughs> lamb, uh, roasted lamb, if it's done correctly, is really good. <laughs> okay. 
So the Christ is our Passover lamb. And uh, this whole process that God went through in Egypt was just really a pattern of what was going to happen uh, going forth when he offered his own son as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So as I mentioned there before, we saw there in the first uh, in the verse uh, in verse five and six, the lamb must be without blemish. So to test it, they would keep up keep up for four days. So they would watch for four days and inspect the lamb to make sure that no marks developed on him, uh, didn't get a, a bad limb, uh, that it wasn't sick. And so that basically what we're going through right now is Jesus when he pre when he presented himself on Palm Sunday. He actually was uh, presenting himself for inspection, and then four days later will be the uh, the killing. Uh, it will be his crucifixion, uh, basically. <clears throat> so under so the fact that Jesus is in town, uh, we've already talked about the Olivet Discourse. We know that when he came in on Palm Sunday, we read before uh, he went and threw out the money changes in the uh, temple. Uh, and then uh, he's been teaching in the temple all week. And so he's been basically on inspection. He's they're inspecting his life. Uh, so it's been under uh, actually kind of uh, uh, what could be a uh, hostile scrutiny. But uh, another verse I might mention about Christ as our Redeemer is 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. I forgot this part. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, <clears throat> but by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Okay. Now back, back to what I was talking about, about being under inspection. And a good example of back in Luke eleven fifty three, And this is kind of what the Pharisees were kind of doing for us. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to, and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that might accuse him of. They never did catch anything, really. <laughs> That's basically what uh, uh, these Pharisees, though, really wanted to find something to, to, uh, to eliminate him on. And the fact that no fault was found uh, was confirmed in the fact uh, of what John, was says in John 18:38. It's interesting that even the, the ruler of that time frame kind of confirms that they couldn't uh, they couldn't find anything. And this is the this is the day of his crucifixion. Pilate said unto him, "What is truth?" And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, "I find in him no fault at all." <laughs> so there, Pilate is confirming uh, for us what we already knew, <laughs> but it also that uh, Jesus, in his opinion, passed inspection. Okay, so as we saw there in verse 6 uh, in Exodus, the lamb thus tested must be slain. So that will happen uh, when Jesus gets crucified further on in our uh, study here. We get some verses to show that uh, uh, in John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, see, symbology there that uh, by Jesus dying on the cross, going into the ground or into the tomb. And during that three days, he actually goes and gets the keys to heaven and hell uh, by defeating death. And thus by doing that, he gives him the, uh, the title deed to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the world, which he will take possession of uh, during the tribulation. Both in Hebrews 9.22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Now, the in sins is my add-on to that. Okay, as we saw in verse 7, the blood must be applied. Uh, this, this answers uh, to a, uh, those remember they saw they applied it to the doorposts of their house. And that's the same thing. That's the same symbology of God's of Jesus' blood being sacrificed for our sins, and, but it uh, it overshadows us and protects us. Uh, some verses on this over in John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, 
but the wrath of, wrath of God abided on him. The blood must be applied of itself without anything. That was a perfect protection from judgment. Uh, we saw that in verse 13. Some other verses on that in 1 John 1, 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This next verse is one of my favorites. They call it the Christian bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Yes. So strong words there in 1 John. Also over in Hebrews 10, 10 and uh, verse 14. By thy which we will, will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. For by one offering he hath perfected for even them that are sanctified. So this feast uh, typified uh, uh, and, and jumping uh, is one of the aspects that talked about in this particular feast is the bread. And, and we know that Christ is the bread of life. <clears throat> and we see that uh, referenced uh, in Matthew 26, 26, that I didn't mention before. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, and this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of it. Uh, to observe the feast was a, uh, so this is uh, also part of the feast, the breaking of bread and the giving of a cup. But actually, believe it or not, in the Exodus itself, the bread was not eaten right away. Uh, it was taken uh, and just uh, hastily cooked and taken with them. And the reason for the unleavened bread is basically that uh, it takes time for bread to rise and there was no time for that. Uh, so that's why that they symbolically always do it with unleavened bread. And if you don't know what unleavened bread is, it's basically a cracker. Uh, so by, by this whole Exodus process, the nation of, uh, of Israel was protected by the blood of the lamb. Uh, and so that, that continues on. And actually from that point on until Jesus died on the cross, every year they would do this for Passover uh, to what they call extend their sins another year. Because a, a real lamb uh, cannot take away sin. And so that, that's the symbology we're talking about here. That uh, Jesus is the only sacrificial lamb uh, that could take away sins forever for, for everyone. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And just finishing up this bread of uh, the bread of life, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26 is the other place. Because one of the ordinances of the uh, church that we celebrate is the ordinance of communion. And that's a, remember, a memorial for us to remember this the same event that Jesus died for our sins. He was the sacrificial lamb. And so when we do communion, we're remembering what Jesus did for us. And we see this also in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. And most pastors read it from this particular verse, even though it's in Matthew also. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. That's the word that the night he was betrayed. That's what it would, this first part we're talking about, the night Jesus betrays him. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is due in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, "This cup is my two is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you shall show that the Lord's death till he come." So that's the ordinance of communion, which is a reflection of this Passover meal and the whole symbology of uh, the uh, perfect sacrificial lamb. So I want to go through that uh, just to try to get an idea 
Uh, no, I'm only, I only read one verse. And that's why we're only doing six verses today. <laughs> uh, so that, uh, uh, so now to continue on in Luke uh, 22, verse 2. So, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Realize that on Passover, uh, that every year, this again was a was a, a yearly thing. That that Jerusalem was uh, there was probably millions of people in Jerusalem at this period of time. It, people would come from all over the world uh, to come to to Jerusalem for Passover. It was one of the required feasts for every able-bodied Jew to come to uh, once a year. And so when he said, when the chief priests and the scribes knew that this time frame there was a lot of people here. They wanted to eliminate this troublemaker named Jesus Christ in their minds, but they, didn't, they feared that the people would ca it would cause an uprising because Jesus had quite a following. They were trying to figure out how to do this uh, without the uh, without causing a uh, uprising. And they realized that uh, during this time frame that Israel was a place that as long as you uh, didn't upset the Romans too badly, that you could pretty much live your life uh, and and worship and do all the things you like to do without any kind of hindrance from them. But the only thing the Romans really cared about was that there wasn't any uh, that things were peaceful and quiet, and there was no uprisings, uh, because they had uh, they were they were always afraid of Rome itself. So they wanted to kind of make sure appease Rome that they wanted to make sure that no bad reports got back to Rome. So that's kind of what the, is being said here. So it typically between Pilate and Herod's, that the chief priests and scribes are kind of like, like I had given in to making, trying to keep the people from uh, doing anything uh, in the way of upsetting the Romans. And that way that uh, they could just maintain their power over the uh, uh, temple and all the temple practices. Well, now we got Jesus that comes on the scene and he's, ca he's causing a bit of an uproar. So they think that he's a problem. So they want to eliminate him. And that's basically what it's saying here. Luke 22, 3. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took Okay. I need the verse I wanted. Try that again. But then entered Satan in the Judas surname Iscariot. So this is what we're really talking about today being of the number of the 12. This is what I meant by a friend. I realized that Judas was chosen by Jesus to be a disciple. And uh, so this is a good example of somebody in our midst that maybe we think that uh, uh, never accepted the Lord Jesus as their savior, because I'm almost I'm, I'm about 100% sure that Satan cannot enter into anyone who has any kind of a uh, uh, faith in the Lord. Because uh, like it always says, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, there's no other room for anybody else. Uh, so if we have the Holy Spirit, there's no way that uh, Satan's dominions can can uh, can enter us. Now they can whisper in our ear, they can talk to us, they can uh, try to convince us of things. Uh, that's that's pretty common. Uh, but to uh, to actually enter into us in in bodily form, so that uh, it kind of proves right here in this statement that Judas never did believe. Uh, and the uh, deity of Christ and his teachings. Verse 4. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. So he kind of uh, uh, got it set up a deal with the uh, chief priests and the uh, captains to uh, lead their men to Jesus at a time frame when there's not a lot of people around. Verse 5. And they were glad and convenient to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. So the whole trick here was to make sure that to, to do it in a way that the whole multitude wouldn't be around. So I thought I'd just, uh, uh, that's the end of that. And we're going to get into the actual getting ready for the profit, uh, for the, uh, for the setup of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, Passover meal next, but I thought at this point I would just show that uh, these are actually fulfillments of prophecy, and I think it's important when we realize that the Bible proves the Bible, and that uh, 
So I thought I'd pick a couple of prophecies that were fulfilled in what we just witnessed so far. Over in Matthew 26, 14 through 16, we're going to talk about uh, a prophecy uh, that's spelled out in uh, Psalms 41, 9 and how it's fulfilled uh, right here. So Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went in unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver unto him unto you, and they convened with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. This is the that was a Matthew account. And I just mentioned the Mark account, which is Mark 14, 10, and 11. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto and when they heard it they were glad and promised to give him money and he thought how he might co conveniently betray him so this is like this is actually fulfillment of prophecy mentioned in psalms 41 9 yea my own familiar friend in whom i trusted which did eat my of my bread and hath lifted up his heel against me well those of you that uh, have done a little study and to uh, how Satan has been working his way towards this day to try to eliminate Jesus Christ from ever being born. It's all based on something God the Father said way back in Genesis 3.15. And if you notice in this psalm, it says, hath lifted up his heel against me. That goes, that, uh, that is reflected in Genesis 3.15. Let me show it to you here. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. Uh, so this is a this is a this is a duel between uh, uh, Satan to try to over to win over uh, the world uh, when he uh, deceived Eve into eating the apple that God told him not to, and that basically that that that's when the war began between Satan trying to stop Jesus from being born. And in this particular case in Genesis 3.15, it shall bruise thy head, which, believe it or not, that happens in Revelation, <laughs> uh, in the tribulation. Uh, and then the other part that we're going to see here, and thou shall bruise his heel. And so that would be what happens to Jesus. But this other part is what when it says, it shall bruise thy head. Hasn't happened yet. That'll actually happen in uh, the, uh, towards the end of the, well, about the midpoint of the tribulation, uh, from my, what I gather. So this idea of the prophecy, too, of the 30 pieces of silver is fascinating, too. That comes out of Zechariah uh, 11, uh, 12, and 13. And I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it upon the potter, a goodly price that I was pleased at of them and i took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the lord interesting prophecy kind of doesn't make sense until it actually happens <clears throat> and part of it actually happens later uh, after the fact but i'll just show it to here but it's actually in matthew 26 uh, 15 through 16 and he said unto them what will you give me and i will deliver him unto you and they convened with him for 30 pieces of silver Verse 16, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. I already read that part. We jump ahead to verse 27, 3 and 4. Judas realized what he had done. I think that by this time, I guess Satan has probably gone out of him. He realizes his mistake. So in uh, Matthew 27, 3 through 10 uh, is what uh, happens because of it. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver piece and said, it is not lawful for us to put it into the treasury because it is the price of blood. So now they can't put it back in the treasury. So what are they going to do with it? I often wondered if they have even thought about Zechariah's uh, uh, prophecy when they were doing this. And they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. 
back in that time frame, it was a responsibility of the temple that if anyone died that didn't have any kin in that area, it was a responsibility of the temple to bury them. And so uh, they took the money and they uh, they, for, they they forecasted the fact they were going to need the land for that. Uh, so they bought a field. So that was, I guess, legitimate. Uh, they couldn't put it into the temple treasury. So they bought some land with it. <laughs> Wherefore, the field was called the field of blood unto this day. And was fulfilled for which was spoken by, now careful about this word, Jeremy the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they, they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. This a term there that Matthew mentions this Jeremy. All right. Jeremiah never prophesied this. It was Zechariah who did. And that's where it comes out of what I just read in Zechariah. I was reading a commentary on it, and it was kind of interesting that uh, Matthew very seldom ever mentioned prophets in his writings. And so it's, most people believe is that if you eliminate the words Jeremiah from that, if you read it again, that was fulfilled that was spoken by, then eliminate Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, and to that, and took the, it would make more sense. So that the thick and then what happened is that just through through time, some uh, scribe somewhere decided that uh, that uh, uh, because it was blank in there that it wasn't supposed to be blank and stuck in a name Jeremy, uh, thinking it came out of Jeremiah and it didn't. Uh, it came out of Zechariah. So that's just speculation. They're not sure why that word got in there because it didn't come from Jeremiah the prophet. It came from Zechariah the prophet. So one little oops in the Bible, uh, and uh, so you don't go looking forward to Jeremiah. It's not in there. So that's all I had for today. And so they used the money to buy the potter's field. So uh, so you can see, I'll just read the uh, Zechariah account again. You can uh, you can see here that I said I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So the weight the weight for my price thirty pieces of silver. I remember Zechariah was just like. It was about 600 years before Christ was even born. But the, the key incident here, and the Lord said unto me, so the Lord is speaking this to Zechariah, cast it unto the potter. And within it, that's an interesting term for Zechariah to write in there. A goodly price that I was priest of, uh, at of them, and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So it's kind of interesting that Zechariah knew this. Uh, way back at about 500 BC. <laughs> so uh, fascinating, uh, some of these prophecies. That's all I had for today. And I uh, will end with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time you got together. And thank you, Lord, for uh, all the things you do for us. And I give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. So I will talk to you guys again tomorrow. And, and I will... Uh, uh, head into the uh getting ready for the i actually had a bunch of pictures to show you but i'll wait till tomorrow because it actually make more sense tomorrow <laughs>